So could the Ballad of Newland be a satire, like television's spitting images, about the local landed gentry and their family split in the 1780s, foreshadowing f events which took place in Heath in summer 1795? 18th century fake news? A parody of political squabbles among the new money gentry from Wakefield who were out of touch with the mood of the local population? If the author uses the real-life dissolution of the monasteries in 1541 by King Henry and Richard Rich as a cover against being sued for slander in the 1790s, can we identify the players in the saga and who was who in the ballad? What prompted the author to write? And who was the author, P.W.? Wakefield in the late 1700s was dominated by a small number of wealthy families, and one of the most prominent was the Milnes family. The Milnes family in today's money were multimillionaires and became bitterly divided about what to do about national politics and the growing unrest in their native city, and this all came to a head during the 1784 elections. They were religious nonconformists, Unitarians, and the law discriminated against them. So many Milnesers were natural opponents of the upper-class Tory party, which was royalist, nationalist and supportive of King George III. But 18th century politics was far more complex and volatile than the party system we have today. The Milnesers all began by supporting the opposition called Whigs. They supported political reform, anti-slavery, the American colonists' struggle for independence and the French revolutionary movement. Among leading Milnesers were cousins Richard Dick Slater Milnes of Fryston Hall, James Milnes of Thorns House and John Milnes of Page Hall, Sheffield, alias Jack the Democrat. Head of the family was 60-year-old Pemberton Pem Milnes and there was also his nephew John Pemberton Haywood who all involved themselves in the politics of the day. In 1784 a constitutional crisis occurred in Parliament and a deep rift appeared in the Milnes family. Desperate to achieve his political ambitions to win a seat, Richard Dick Milnes abandoned his Whig family tradition and supported Tory William Pitt, the Prime Minister, and became a true blue loyalist and MP for York, coming out on the winning side in the 1784 election. He became a loyalist, supported the King, and was parodied as the King's man in the ballad. Richard Milnes was also an only son, as was Richard Rich in the ballad. Opposed to the King's chosen Prime Minister William Pitt in 1784 was the Fox North Coalition, led by Whig Charles James Fox, allied with Tory Lord North and the Earl of Portland, who were trying to oust Pitt as Prime Minister. As the remaining years of the 1780s unfolded and the American and French revolutions turned bloody, politics continued to churn and the split in the Milnes family politics became increasingly very bitter. In 1785, head of the family, 60-year-old Pemberton Pem Milnes withdrew from the Whigs under Pitt. Pem and his nephew John Pemberton Haywood couldn't stomach joining the Tories directly but did support the old Whig splinter party who went into coalition with the Tories. The split was cemented as the French Revolution in 1789 unfolded and Pemberton withdrew further from reform, believing it to be irresponsible revolution. He allied himself with the Earl of Portland and the new Tory coalition under William Pitt at the 1790 election. Richard James Jack then switched sides and supported Charles James Fox in hailing the events in France and sought to bring about revolution at home. They and the other Milnes men became known as the Foxites or New Whigs. These political twists, economic turmoil, revolution and wars abroad made for an unsettling cost of living crisis for Wakefield and enabled our satirist to draw effective parallels between the turmoil of the Georgian era and Tudor times. Why is this relevant to the Battle of the Ballad of Newlands publication in 1790? The ballad reflects the then current political views of Whigs, one that remained till well into the 19th century, that reform was bad and supporters of reform were traitors. Pemberton Milnes and John Pemberton Haywood were seen as turncoats by their family, but were, as old Whigs, still suspected as would-be traitors to the Crown by the Tories. They are the Hospitaller Knights, out on a limb, holding out against radical reform. Two knights are named in the ballad, Sir Vineyard Port and Sir Claret Vine. Pem Milnes was a functioning alcoholic who drank six bottles of port a day. He's Sir Vineyard Port. His nephew John Pemberton Haywood, who was alleged to drink more claret than any man alive and died weighing over 40 stone, is Sir Claret Vine. Richard Dick Slater Milnes, MP, 
is Richard Rich and the opposing king's man in the ballad. What has this to do with Newland? In the 1780s and 90s, there was no trace of Newland of the Knights Hospital as medieval preceptory buildings. John Sylvester Smith bought the estate from the local Bunny family and built a fine hall on the site. Pictured is John Sylvester Smith the Younger, his son. After his move to fashionable Bath for his health in 1779, he leased Newland Hall in 1783 to then fellow Whig Richard Dick Milnes, our Richard Rich, who already owned Fryston Hall, but in 1781 married wealthy Rachel Busk and wanted to show off his new wealth. By another baffling coincidence, much later than the publication of the ballad, by a codicil in his mother-in-law's will in 1802, two years before his death, Richard Dick Milnes took the surname Rich to access wife Rachel's family money. So his new name, Richard Rich, coincidentally became the same as that of Henry VIII's Richard Rich in the ballad. On Richard's early death in 1804, James Milnes, who had married Rachel's sister Mary Ann, changed his name too to James Rich. Richard Milnes therefore died rich by name and rich by nature. The ballad says that the Knights Hospitallers had a castle with four golden turrets. Newland certainly hadn't. At best, it was, under the medieval knights, a fortified farm. None of the Milnes family had old money castles. They built Georgian townhouses or purchased or rented existing country house estates to parade their wealth. But there is a very good candidate just down the road, Heath Old Hall, with its four turrets. A probable fortified manor house built on the Elizabethan style in 1595 and in the 1790s owned by the Fauquier family and rented out. It fits the description, locality and era of the ballad setting. But perhaps the golden turrets of the ballad is also about satirising the pretensions of the Milnes family to acquiring the country house life. They are new money with aspirations to the medieval castles of the gentry. In another uncanny prediction of the future, Loyalist volunteer militia sent in 1795 were set up and ordered around like the king's men in the ballad to carry out the will of the king. But at the time of the publication of the ballad in 1790, they did not yet exist. It's most likely that the bands of soldiers mentioned in the ballad's battle on both sides were mere supporters of the new Whig or old Whig cause. However, one knight on the side of Richard Rich is named as young Bertram. Could this be a reference to Robert Pemberton Milnes? Richard's eldest son, born in 1784, who would go on to inherit Fryston Hall and sit in Parliament as Whig MP for Pontefract in 1806, following his father's footsteps into Parliament? Thus our cast of possible characters is complete. All of these coincidences and connections to the past became just too much for a keen satirist to pass up, so the Battle of Newell and Ballard was conceived to make fun, but safely, of the political establishment the events of the time, and also perhaps make a comment about history repeating itself at a time when calls for reform and oppression were very much current themes. Or is it just an unproven theory? You decide. The events of 1795 certainly bore out the author's views about the way the wind was blowing. Maybe he deserves more credit than he's given. Following the safe publication of the Battle of Newland in print and the later events of 1795, the younger Milneses, Richard, Jack and James, kept on opposing the Tory establishment, organising anti-slavery meetings, mass petitions to end the Napoleonic Wars, and toppled local Tory power in the 1806 election, winning a seat in Parliament in Pontefract with Richard's son. Their family newspaper, the Wakefield Star, trumpeted reform politics. One of its regular correspondents is known only by his initials, P.W., who in one of his letters to the editor, described himself as a local lawyer. The author of the satirical Barrad could very well, as John Goodchild suspected, have been Benjamin Clarkson of Alverthorpe Hall, a lawyer and land agent of limited ability, who more through luck than skill rose through wakeful society to live the country house lifestyle. He fancied himself as a man of letters, literary and political comment. Clarkson's work fits neatly into the well-established genre of epic satirical ballads, which place events from the present into the past as indirect slandering of persons through literary works to avoid libel prosecution. Therefore, Clarkson, like Defoe, Pope, Mary Wortley Montague and Jonathan Swift before him, chose clever satire to make his point.
On the back of one of the pages of the manuscript of the Ballad of the Battle of Newland is a draft letter, in the author's own handwriting, to the publisher of the Yorkshire magazine, seeking to get the ballad published, and claiming that it is an ancient ballad that has been found and transcribed by him, and is the work of the Pinder of Wakefield, or P.W., a person unlikely to have the educational standard required to compose such a ballad in 1541. Needless to say, the work was not published in the Yorkshire magazine, and, too long for a letter to his favourite newspaper, the Wakefield Star, the author P.W., Pinder of Wakefield, Benjamin Clarkson, resorted to publishing it himself. Our P.W. was certainly an unreliable narrator on several levels, as a satirist, a nom de plume, and now as a would-be forger of medieval documents. Future historians may be able to verify our suspicions, but for now, you decide. <laughs>